Or you know, you know the classic one is in church life when the, when the pastor doesn't know what to do or someone up front loses track, they go, I just feel like we should all pray. Let's just pray. And while everyone bows their head, we're rummaging around. What, where'd I put that thing? Uh, hey, I heard a story a number of years ago and I want to share it with you and I'll bounce off this story. Um, we, me and my wife were involved in an organisation called uh, Youth with a Mission for many years and uh, that's where we met, that's where um, I walked across a room one day, she saw me, realised she had to have me, we fell in love, <laughs> got married and beautiful children later we're still together after all these years. Um, anyway, I remember one time we had a visiting missionary that came over from the island of Haiti and he shared this story with us. He said there was a missionary team from the United States that had gone across to Haiti to serve the, the Haitian people. And they were out in a sort of remote sort of village area. And um, for a, a, a toilet, what they had is a big hole dug in the ground. And then they had a piece of plywood over the top of this big hole with a hole cut in so that when people needed to go, they, you, you would aim for the hole and do your business. So there was a young uh, man, 18, 19, on the team, and he needed to go to the toilet. And he needed a number two. Everyone know what a number two? Yep, I'll leave it at that. So he needed to do a number two. And so he's walked over to where the, the toilet section was, and he squatted down ready to do what he needed to do. And as he squatted down, a tarantula, big tarantula, came out from under the board, leapt up and attached itself to his butt cheek. So as you would imagine, as any of us would, this freaked this young man out and he jumped up in the air straight and clutched like that to try to wipe it away. Anyway, he's come down and his legs went straight through the hole and his feet were dangling above the abyss and uh, he was stuck from about his waist down with just the waist up. Well, of course, he frantically starts screaming, help, help. And a couple of other team members uh, heard his cries for help and came running to him. When they got there, they just saw half this body sticking out of the hole, screaming out for help. So they ran over to him and to try to help him, they thought, here's what we're going to do. We'll get, I'll get on one side of him, brace my legs and grab his arm. You get on the other side, brace, grab his arm, and we'll go one, two, three, and we'll pull him up out of the hole together. Unfortunately, their plan didn't go exactly as they thought it would because they were standing on a piece of plywood. So they've got either side, they've gone one, two, three, and instead of him coming up, the plywood snapped in half and all three of them fell down into the sea of forgetfulness. All three of them had to then get airlifted by, by plane back to the United States for medical treatment. They got really, really sick. And every time I hear that story, it reminds me of this simple fact that Sometimes we think what we're doing is really helping people, but sometimes it's really not. Amen? Sometimes what we're doing we think is, a, is, is, is helping people, but quite often what we think is a help to somebody is not always necessarily going to be a help. So if we're going to help people, we want to really think about whether what we're doing is helpful or not before we lunge in and we all end up in the abyss together, airlifted to another country. I want to help you today. So... Um, for those of you that are visiting, um, we, 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 there, there are certain Sundays where we sort of talk a bit more general, and, but there are some Sundays it's a little bit like a family, I guess, gathering and the family gets together. And how many of you know when you get your family together, you kind of talk a certain way to your family. When guests are there, you leave certain things out. And you t- so t- today's a little bit uh, family uh, oriented, but I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the church and a little bit about, we, we've been talking about uh, the difference between being a part of the crowd or being part of community. How many of you know the world is full of crowds? Full of crowds. Crowds are everywhere. But crowds don't make a difference. It, it's communities that make a difference. Amen? You, you, don't, you don't thrive in a crowd. You hide in a crowd. But you thrive in a community. And you grow in a community. Crowds don't necessarily care about what's going on with the person to the left or to the right. But community care about the needs of the people within their community. And we've been talking for a few weeks now about the difference between just being a part of the crowd or being a part of the community. And let's be real, a Sunday gathering, a church fellowship, whatever term you want to use, can easily be a crowd to you and not a community. And that comes back to you, your own decision in terms of how far into that you enter, how you approach your community and, and, and your involvement and so on. So I want to I wanna help you today. So I want to just say a few things, and I don't want anyone to get offended, 
But I just want to point us back to this collection of ancient documents uh, written over 1,600 years by 27 different authors on three separate continents. And you've got it all bound together and we call it a Bible and in doing so we kind of lose the magnificence of what the, the content that's in there. But I want to talk to you a little bit about some things out of there. And I want to sort of lead to a, a point at the end, so hopefully you can stick with me and follow me. Um, before we do, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 to 8. There's this story in here of, of, of Jesus. It says that he stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. So men brought to him a paralysed man lying on a mat. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. That's a big, bold statement, your sins are forgiven. And of course, you know, if you're sitting there in a crowd, how many of you know for me personally? It would be easier for me to walk up and say, your sins are forgiven. I can't prove nothing, really, can I? Your sins are forgiven. How do we know? But if I say, take up your mat and walk, all of a sudden I'm on show. All of a sudden what I'm saying can now be tested. Am I really serious? Is what I'm saying true? And so Jesus finds himself in this situation. He says, your sins are forgiven you. At this summer, the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, he said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? And of course the answer is, which one's easier? Well, your sins are forgiven is the easier one to say, isn't it? Because there's nothing tangible about it. Get up and walk, that's a very different thing. So he says, which one's easier? Sins are forgiven or get up and walk? He says, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive the sins. So he said to the paralysed man, get up, take your mat and go home. Now watch this. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to men. Now, I'm pretty sure this was not the first time this guy was told to get up. You know how I know that? Because I also have friends. And so do you. How many times have you had someone say to you, oh, get up, take a spoonful of cement, you'll be right. Anyone ever had that? I was at a touch football tournament in uh, Port Macquarie, uh, Coffs Harbour, Port Macquarie, I lose track of where I was. Um, uh, last weekend, was it? Weekend? I can't remember. Recently. My first year of playing over 50s, yes, you're amazed, I'm over 50. <laughs> and uh, so I'm down there at this tournament for the weekend, and of course, when you hit our age, it's not a question of, uh, 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 do you have an injury? The question is, can you play with your injury? That's, everyone's running around injured, you know? And guys are dropping like flies, and you just should hear some of the comments that they're saying to each other, you know? Um, oh, you know, it's over here. The guy's laying on the ground, writhing in pain. What? Oh, it's your heart. I found it. It's over here. Do you want it back? Get up, you, you know? They don't go soft on each other. So I'm sure this is not the first time this guy was told to get up. But this time, it was God telling him to get up. This was Jesus telling him to get up. And so the thing is, he gets up and he starts walking. God told him to do something, he did it. It's, it's not a profound concept, is it? It's very simple. It's, 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 I guess in the church space, we would call it obedience. As parents, you would call it obedience. You tell your children to do something and you just want them to do it. Yeah? Jesus tells this guy just to get up. The interesting thing about God is that it's amazing that... that God doesn't tend to do a lot of things for us, does he? You know what I'm saying? He does. It's almost like God has a will. This is my desire for you. And this is the outcome that I'm, I can produce. But there's this space in between there where God says to us, now you've got to play a part in this too. You've got to play a part in this. Joshua, I'm going to tear them walls down and you guys are going to take the city of Jericho. But I want you to march around the city. Seven days. Now I want you at the end of the seventh day to go, ah, the walls will fall down. Do you trust me? Will you do it? And so he does. I would have felt like a bit of a clown, I reckon. What about you? Seven days. First five days you're just marching around, you know? I mean, how many people, if I said to you, right, look, I really believe that God's spoken to me, okay? We are going to march around, completely around Lismore. We're going to do it every day for seven days. On the seventh day, by the way, we're going to do it seven times. And the last time we do it, we're going to go, and when we do, all poverty is going to cease in town. There's never going to be another flood in town again. Uh, all debts will be, you know. I mean, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? I reckon most of you would check out before we got there for the first walk. I'd lose half of you after the first day. By the third day, it'd probably just be me and, and my wife, and, you know. I think it would, it would be crazy, but they did it. And God did what he did. Yeah, you've got Gideon who's going to go, God says you're a mighty man of valour and you're going to go out and fight this battle on behalf of Israel and, and defeat the enemy and... 
Um, you know, he's got enough men there to do the job and God says, no, that's too many. I want you to get rid of some numbers. And, and he does. He gets rid of numbers, and, which would go against everything he'd ever read in a battle manual. You know, the, the basics of war are they have X amount. If you have more, you've got a good chance of winning. But God goes, no, you've got more, but I'm going to windle you down so that you've got less so that I get glory out of it. But, but the point is he did it. And this is the thing we see time and time again in this collection of ancient documents when people did this simple little thing called obedience. That it was amazing what God could do, I mean. It's amazing what God can do on the back of obedient, obedience. And before anyone is ever obedient in their actions, obedience is already in their hearts. So it's almost like it's amazing what God can do with obedient people. What God can do with obedient people. People who will do what God is saying. See, God's message is very rarely, let me give you something to watch. It's rather, let me tell you something to do. Let me tell you something to do. I'm not here to give you something to watch because I'm not creating a community of spectators. I'm com- creating a community of participants. And if I get a community of participants, where well, can I do some things? Amen? Where well, can I do some things in your life? Where well, can I do some things in your community? But I'm looking for a community of participants. See, transformation and miracles happen on the back of participation, not observation. But it's so much easier to sit back and watch. So much easier to, 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 to coast through life as an observer, as a spectator. And it's so much easier in church as well because we kind of don't like to agitate too much. We don't like to push too much for people to participate. We kind of go, look, we'd love you to participate. It'd be great, but, you know, I don't want to push too hard because everyone walk out the door. Nobody wants to be here. But I go back to this collection of ancient documents and I can't help but see this community of faith that was once called the way, that we now call the church, that was a community of participation. It was a community, not of observation, not a community of people who sat back and watched, but a community of people that put their hand to the plow and said, no, no, what can I do? How do I get involved in this thing? Luke chapter 17, verse 11 to 14. It says, now Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and he travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go, show yourself to the priests. And what did they do? Well, they just simply did what Jesus said to do. And it says, and as they went, they were cleansed. As they went. And imagine if they had just sat there and said, no, no, that's fine. We just want to watch you. <laughs> we just want to observe. I just want to see how you do things. I just... But they didn't. He told them to do something very simple, very basic, nothing theologically deep and profound here. Yet it's probably the most deep and theologically profound uh, concept that the church needs to get a grip on, and that is simply obedience and doing. Not just sitting back and watching and observing while everybody else does stuff. I'm not just talking about it in the context of church. I'm talking about in the context of the world. Getting out there and participating and doing the things that God wants us to do. See, the call to follow Jesus is not a call to passively observe, passively observe what God is doing. It's a call to radically do what God is saying. It's not, it's not passively observe what he is doing. It's to get out there and do what it is that God is saying. And in church circles, we'll use the term obedience for this. And I'm sorry if that word obedience offends anybody. I know it does today because we have a, a thing in our society, nobody tells me what to do. You know, I hate to break it to you. You're being told what to do every minute of every day, whether you like it or not. <laughs> That's why you're driving the left-hand side of the road. Let's be real. Come on, people. Let's be real. That's why you drive on the left-hand side of the road. Yep. That's why you pay your taxes. That's why you turn up at 7 a.m., probably at a job that you're not really into, but you know you've got to be there because why? Someone told you. Huh? And if you think a person who genuinely does not do anything anyone tells me and really lives by that philosophy, no one tells me what to do, they're probably in prison doing exactly what they're told. (laughs) Amen? It's, it's not rocket science. It's a fallacy, this whole, no one tells me what to do. Just be humble enough. Everyone is being told what to do. question is, who's telling you what to do it? Who's the one that you're taking the accused from, ultimately, in life? And in different sections of life, there are different people that, that tell us what to do, and we live and we obey in certain ways. But overall, what I'm talking about here is as followers of Jesus, are we living in obedience to what God is doing, or are we happy to sit back and watch what he's doing? Now, if the call to follow Jesus is a call to radical action, then the church should be a community of radical action. Amen? The church should be a community of radical action. 
There shouldn't be uh, space for us to just be uh, passive observers who sit back and watch as the world unfolds, whatever's happening, or we sit back and just watch as our community of faith just, you know, uh, I, I've often... Uh, 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 say to the kids, I coach kids at um, sporting tournaments and stuff and they have absolutely no idea what goes on behind the scenes so they can go away for a weekend, do what they love and play touch football against the best players in the country and win medals and all. They have no idea all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. They think that we literally just got this little pill and we just added water, it was you know, just add water and it all pops up. You just add water and all of a sudden your accommodation sorted, all of a sudden your, your, your registrations are done, yeah, just add water, it's easy, you know. Well, you get to go and play and have, have your fun. They have no idea, but there's so much stuff that goes on. But the call to follow Jesus is a call to radical action, and the church should be a place of radical action. It's interesting in Matthew 18 when Jesus speaks about uh, the church. He has this conversation with a group of people following him, and he says to them this. He says, who do men say I am? And they say, some say you're John the Baptist who had been, been uh, killed and come back, and some say you're Elijah and one of the prophets and so on. But then he narrows it down. He says, that's great, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And of course, Peter says, you are Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words, you are God. You're the one that as a nation of Israel we've been waiting for. You're that one that we've been waiting for. And then Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you and so on. Then he goes on and he says, I, 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 he says that the, I'm, I'm building a community, a church. And he makes this statement. He says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Remember that statement? It's interesting because gates are defensive, aren't they? A gate is a defensive thing. It's not an offensive weapon. A gate is defensive. So in other words, what Jesus is saying there is that I'm going to raise up a church and hell itself, call it darkness, wickedness, evil, whatever, he's saying that, that it is not advancing and encroaching on you. It's locking its gates to try to keep you out because you're encroaching on it. You should be moving forward as a community and making a difference, going into dark places and making them light, tearing down things that are wrong, setting up a system of righteousness and goodness and looking after the poor and looking after these kids and all this kind of stuff that we know is good inherently, whether you have God or not, you know inherently there's a basic good and a bad, a right and a wrong. And he's saying, that's the community that I'm building. We're a community that should actually be going forward and advancing. And he says, I'll give you keys, doesn't he? Well, keys unlock gates. So Jesus is saying there that this community of faith is not something that mopes around in the shadows, in the corners with its hands up going, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. We should be marching forward, making a difference in the world. That's who we're meant to be. And if we don't believe that, then I'm challenging you. Go back and read the first 30 years of church history. It's in, it's in this collection of ancient documents under the title Acts. It's called the Acts. But it's a history document, 30 years of church history. And you won't see a church hiding in a corner, afraid of being caught out. You'll see a church that, that, that stood up for God, stood up for right, that proclaimed this story of Jesus because we believed it even to the point of death and marched forward into society to the point where in 320 AD, the Roman Empire made Christianity the official religion of the empire. Now that wasn't because everybody believed in the Jesus story, but it was because Constantine and everybody around recognised the benefits of living this way. They recognised the societal benefits to the teachings of Jesus. And so the most powerful empire of the day says we're going to make Christianity our official religion. Now if you look at the church today, I don't feel like we're pushing forward like that, are we? We're kind of holding back a little bit. And I just wonder, I just wonder whether we've lost that call to radical obedience. I wonder whether we've lost the, the faith that we need to radically go forward and be the people that God has called us to be. Dwight Eisenhower, the, the ex-president of the United States back in the 50s, he said this. He said, every gathering of Americans, whether a few on the porch of a crossroads store or amassed thousands in a great stadium, is the possessor of a potentially immeasurable influence on society. What a statement. Every gathering of Americans, whether a few on the porch of a crossroads store or mass thousands in a great stadium, is the possessor of a potentially immeasurable influence on the future. Immeasurable influence on the future. Now let me ask you this. How much more the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, equipped with gifts and talents, motivated by love and compassion, filled with the wisdom of God and called by God to go into all the world, how much more of a difference can that church make? couple of faces staring at me going, eh. Like I told you, I'm trying to help you here today. I, I don't want to pull you out because we're all going to fall in together. So I'm, I'm coming about this a little bit of a, a different way. But for the church to have that kind of impact in the world today that it had centuries ago, 
We all have to do our bit. We all have to participate, every person. No observers, just participants in the kingdom of God. That's what God had to work with in the beginning. It was a community of participants that participated in the work of God, what God was doing in their local communities, what God was doing in, in the world around them, what God was doing in their local churches. And yes, we'll get to this in a few weeks' time, the Bible speaks of individual local churches. It does. Again, I know that... I, I mean, I stand up here all the time, don't I? And I say, church is not the building, and, and it's not. But I can also show you where Paul uh, and Peter and these guys actually talk about church as the collective bigger body. I can also tell you where they talk about different churches in different communities. I can show you where at times they refer to church as the place where people gathered. Biblically, there is no one model. But what I'm saying here is broad brush as a church, if we are participants, then it's amazing what God could do on the back of radical obedience. And I don't know about you, but I look around the church world today and I think, you know what, the church is really, we, we look like we've got about as much power and authority as the Lions Club. Matter of fact, in most cases, the Lions Club are doing better things because at least they do a barbecue every Saturday, raise money for charities. Not having to go, I'm just rattle a couple of cages here to get us to think because here's what I want. I want 2023 to something we spring and bounce into in a really, really positive way. I don't want the, you know, the slow wind up to the new year. Everyone waits for January 1, like that's when you make your New Year's resolutions and the world changes. Anyone like that? And you've made the same resolutions for the last six years and each year they last one week less than they did the year before. But we keep saying, it's true. Statistically, most New Year's resolutions are going to run the gamut within about four to six weeks. After six weeks, 95% of them cease no more. There's nothing magical about January 1. Today could be the day that we turn around and walk out these doors. Today could be the day that we make the decision in our heart, I'm going to be radically obedient to my Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ from this moment on. Come what may, whatever the cost, I'm going to be radically obedient to him because I know if I live in radical obedience... Here's the thing. We, we, we read the book of Acts. We look at this church. We see what God is doing through these believers and we believe it and we would amen it and high-five it and say that, yes, we believe God can heal the sick today and I unequivocally believe it, have seen it, been a part of it, Completely. I believe that God can set people free of all kinds of things. I believe God can bring uh, uh, people together. I believe that God can heal emotional wounds. I believe that God can help people in all and any possible way. And I've seen it time and time again. But at the same time, even though I believe in all that stuff, it's not enough for me just to believe it. I want to be a part of a community and a time and an era and a generation where we're seeing it. Because the early church didn't just believe a bunch of things about a powerful God. They lived it and they saw it and it's documented. It's documented for a reason. So that we would not be immature enough to think these are great philosophies or ways of thinking or some kind of uh, 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 way, blueprint for the law. But but it's not real. It's not practical. It's not tangible. It's very real, very practical, and extremely tangible. And nowhere in this book of ancient documents is there a use-by date where God said, I've decided to no longer do that stuff anymore. God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The challenge that's in my heart, and I hope for all of us, is that we know God has not changed, but something's changed. So what's left? Well, it's most likely the church. It's not the gates of hell, because Jesus said, "That, that can't prevail against us. So what else is there out there? Maybe, 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 maybe we've lost that sense of radical obedience to God. Maybe. Maybe we've lost that sense of participation in what God is doing and we're happy to sit back and just be observers and watch other people. I heard somebody describe once, uh, I'm trying to remember who said it, that they said the church is kind of like a, it's like a sporting event. Said you've got 80,000 people in the stands who need to exercise watching 27 people on the field play who don't need any exercise. And I thought, wow, that's actually really good. (laughs) Wish I could remember who said it. So if you tell someone that and they think it's great, you can just say Al said it, that's fine. That's okay. 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 12 to 21. God called you not just to himself. Do you know that? What was the first time that God said it's not good? I say, I, tell you, I say this all the time. You should be able to throw it back at me when? When, Adam. when it was just God and Adam. God said, it's not good. It's not just me and God. I don't just need me and God. I don't need you. I just need God. Thank you. That's weird. That leads to all kinds of weird stuff. God said, it's not good. He said, you need me and you need community. So we need each other. And when you came to faith, you were not just called to a relationship with God. You were actually called to a relationship with the body of Christ. 
You are called not just to God, you are called to this thing that the, these writers talk about called a body. First Corinthians 12, uh, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he says this, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. And so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part but many. So he's saying there are many individual parts in the kingdom of God, but you are so conjoined together that we're calling you a body. You are a body. You are a body. We were not just called. When I came to faith, I was not just called to relationship with God. According to these writers, I was called to relationship with you as well. Whether I like it or not, and whether you like it or not, we're stuck with each other because somehow we've been conjoined together and that conjures up all kinds of weird thoughts in my head, I'll tell you. But it doesn't matter. We're, we're a body. And so in the same way that we're passionate about our relationship with God and passionate about that vertical uh, uh, thing, we've got to be passionate about the horizontal too. We've got to have the same passion because we're called to that. God says you can't have one without the other. If you come to me, here's what I'm doing. I'll put you in a body. You're a part of the body of Christ. Now if the foot, watch this, in verse 13, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. Every part of the body has a function, amen? Every part of the body has something that it does, that it contributes. And, and here's a picture of one part of the body going, oh, well, because I'm not that, I've I got nothing to contribute. He's saying, don't let that kind of pride lie to you. Every part of the body has a function. Every part of the body has something to contribute. So don't be like this part of the body here that says, because I'm not, because I'm not Daniel and I can't lead worship, oh, I've got nothing to give. Because I'm not up there with a the microphone preaching or because I don't run a small group or because I... Hey, everybody has something that has been placed in you, a fingerprint of God for some positive contribution to the world but also to the body. Amen? There's something that you have. So I'm not going to embarrass... I don't want to embarrass Neville, right? But I'm going to embarrass Neville. I don't mean to embarrass you, Neville, because I've known Neville for a long time. When I, did my, when I was 18 and I was doing a, a, my um, a, a project for automotive technology at Ballina High School, uh, Neville was an auto electrician down there. So I remember taking my uh, little bike to Neville and going, can you do the, the electrics for me? So I met Neville many, many years ago, and uh, I don't know whether you're a believer then or not. I certainly wasn't. And then anyway, we've reconnected in recent years with some men's events, and, and now you guys are here, and it's fantastic to have you here. But, but we're having a Christmas service in a few weeks. And so Neville comes up and goes, I've got a couple of ideas. You know, I can do snow cones. So I, can, would you mind if I do snow cones at the Christmas service? Who's going to say no to that? Snow cones at the Christmas service. And on top of that, guess what? I do fairy floss. Who's going to say no to fairy floss? All the parents are going to say no, but the kids aren't going to say no. They want the fairy floss, you know? And he comes up again this morning with another one. And I'm thinking, that's, that's the body. That's, everybody has something that they can contribute. Everyone has something they bring to the table. We're, just, we're limited by our own creativity, really, aren't we? We're limited by our own creativity and our own image of ourselves. Oh, but oh, Neville could have easily gone, well, look, I'm not a foot, all right, so I can't. No, no, no. Look, here's what I've got. Here's what I can do. Hey, does this help? Does this contribute? Can I do something? Awesome. We're all part of a body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. Whether you like it or not, whether you think you are or not, you are. You're a part of this thing called the body. Whether you think you've got anything to give or not, you're a part of the body. Why? God said so. It's his call. It's his body. And he thought you are a pretty good piece, so he stuck you on there. He put you there. Isn't that awesome? And if the, oh, I should say, because I'm not an eye, and so on, uh, where am I up to? It, it, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, watch this, just as he wanted them. Don't fight against God, people. Don't sit there wishing you were something else or somebody else. Don't fight against God. He put parts in the body, he says, just as he wanted them. You should, you should embrace that. Embrace the fact that you have a function in the body because God put you in the body and gave you something to function with. That's biblical. It's biblical. 
Now, the thing is, are you going to find that and do something with that? That's, 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 that's where the rubber meets the road for each individual. But you have something to contribute because he placed the parts in the body just as God wanted them to be. Relax. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to have things you don't have or contribute to things you can't. But there's something you can. Something you can. Embrace it and run with it. If they're all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but we're still one body. We're still one body. Then he goes on and says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the hand cannot, uh, the, the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you, and so on and so on. That's another type of pride, isn't it? I'm better than you, I don't need you. We're, 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 I'm self sufficient, I don't need what you've got, and so on. He says, No, don't do that either. All of you just get this one thing. Every part of the body has a function, every function is important, and everybody has something to contribute. It's that simple. This is what Paul's trying to say. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Keep it simple, stupid. What have you got? One body, but many, many members. Each part of the body is there to perform a function, not just to look pretty. And there are many different functions within a body and so on. Um, God puts the body together just as he wants it. And he designed each part to have a unique and important function. Romans 12, 4 to 8. Here's his point to the Romans. He's going to use all these verses to say one simple thing. Whatever you got, just do it. Just do it, would you? For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, but they all have a function, don't they? It's not the same, but they all have a function. He says, so in Christ we, though many, for one body. There it is again. We're one body people. And each member belongs to all the others. Wow, wouldn't that be worth exploring a little bit one Sunday? We all belong to each other. Interesting thought. That's how connected we are in the mind and eyes of God. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. In other words, whatever you got, just do it. Find a way to do it. No one else can do it for you. You have a unique function. Find a way. Don't sit back and go, oh, there's nothing here. Yes, there is. Maybe we don't know what it is yet. But there's stuff for everyone to contribute and to do. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll move through quick. Ephesians chapter 4. was 15 to 16. Again, Paul writing to these Ephesian believers. He says, speaking the truth in love, he says, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. We're growing. We're meant to be growing, aren't we? Yep. You only grow by participating. How many of you, how many of you go to the gym? Anyone here go to the gym? Besides me? Yeah, some of you go to the gym. So, yep. so Pauline, when you go to the gym, do you, 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 I guess you get your towel and your bag and everything and you go and you swipe your card, whatever, you walk on in, then you grab a chair and you sit in the chair and you watch people work out? You don't. Anyone, anyone do that? Anyone pay for their gym membership and you rock up and you, you go in there, you got your towel, your water bottle, make sure the bottle's full and then you, when you get in, you grab a chair and you just sit down so you can just observe other people and afterwards you feel so much stronger and better because you... Of course you don't. Of course you don't. You grow not by observing things, you grow by participating in things. Amen? And he's saying to the Ephesian church here, part of your call, everyone, we wonder what's the call of God from all... Hey, well, here's part of the call. Grow up. Grow up. And this is not an isolated scripture. He says that to most of the churches, at some point, peeps, here's the deal. You're going to have to grow up. You can't keep drinking milk and you can't keep sitting back and watching and having somebody else wiping your bottom and somebody else bringing your microwave meals to you. At some point, you've got to get up and start participating because you don't grow by observing. You've got to start doing. You've got to start doing. We're, we're growing to become, in respect, the mature body of him who is head. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. Watch this. Every, the body grows and builds itself up in love. It grows and it builds itself up. So there's something about everybody performing their function. Two things happen. Number one, he says the body grows. Now, I believe he's talking numerically. The church grows. The church grows when they see a community of people that actually live what they say they believe. Don't just say this, but live different. There's something about that. There's something powerful about the witness of the church from the outside looking in when we see a community of people actually doing this stuff. It says that we grow numerically, but it also says that it builds itself up too. So every, here's the thing. Every time anyone in this room is obedient to what God is saying to them, it has an impact on the whole body. 
This is the point he's getting at. We're so interconnected that, 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 that your obedience has an impact on the people around you. It builds faith in them. It, gives the, it challenges them. It holds others to account. Hey, God, God says I should be living like this and I am. And if I'm not, that, 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 that imagery, that testimony, that what I'm seeing, that, it holds me to account. We're so connected. But yet we're still individual members who have to make our own decisions up. But I love the end of this. He says it grows and builds itself up in love. But here's the condition. Only as each part does its work. Only as each part does its work. As everybody does their bit, here's what happens. It builds itself up and it grows. See, Paul's addressing the Ephesian church here. And here's what he's telling them. You are never called to turn up and observe. You're called to grow up and serve. You're called to grow up and serve. And we see this message again and again and again. See, children want to be served, don't they? Anyone with kids? They just want you to do everything for them. (laughs) Make my bed, cook my food. (laughs) Daniel's still probably doing it, huh? I see Ruth going, you're like that. See, the end result of this is growth in the body. See, the New Testament nowhere encourages us to attend a local church. Alone. We're encouraged to get together. We're encouraged to be together. We're encouraged to do what we're doing, but never for the purpose of simply attending. It encourages us to engage in a local community of believers. Amen? We're encouraged to engage, not attend. Attendance has never been the goal. Engagement is the goal. And when the church is engaged with one another and engaged with God and engaged in mission, that church grows and prospers. A church that just simply attends and observes will stagnate and eventually die off. And when it dies, here's the sad thing, the community won't even miss it. The community won't even miss it. And that's a tragedy. When I go back and look at this movement that started where they were actually told that, hey, these people who've turned the world upside down have come here. If we disappeared, would the community even care? Would they even notice that there's nobody meeting in that little industrial building up the top. Well, that, that, the question, the answer to that comes back to you and me individually. What are we doing? Are we engaging with our faith on a local level here? Are we engaging in the community? Are we engaging? Or are we happy just to simply attend a crowd or do we want to be a part of an engaged community? And we'll finish with this. Anyone get COVID during COVID? Yeah? Hands up if you caught COVID at some point. Yeah, quite a number of us did. I did. I got COVID and, and, and you know what was the worst part about for me personally? It was different for everybody, but for me, I got COVID. I had about four really bad days with it. And then I came through the other end. I was negative and life went on. For about eight months, I struggled with energy. They call it long COVID. Anyone heard that term, long COVID? Eight months. I, I, about the eight month mark, I started to feel like I was kind of running on all cylinders. But if I'm brutally honest to this day, I still don't feel like I fully recovered. I'll go for about a month or two and I feel good and then bang, I feel this lethargy again, just like I felt back then. And I still feel like there's this residue of, of that on me, this apathy, this energyless, this, this, this lifeless kind of thing that's still kind of hanging around with me. And a lot of people have experienced that, and maybe some of you in this room have experienced that too. Then they call it long COVID. And I think the church is maybe suffering from a little bit of long COVID, if I'm honest. We haven't quite got our spiritual vitality back. We haven't quite got our energy levels back to where they were. We're still fatigued when it comes to church. I'm talking about engagement, not attendance. They've done surveys recently in the Western church, and here's what they found. People that used to put their name on a roster, for example, twice a month, are now, on average, doing it once a month. They run courses and they might have had 30 people sign up for the courses. 25 would actually turn up to do the course. Now they get 30 people registered, they get about 15. There's almost like this, this lag, this fatigue when it comes to engaging with and serving in a local church these days. And it's a residue from what we've been through in terms of COVID. I know a lot of people reprioritise their lives. Who reprioritised their life during COVID? I did. I sat back and looked at my life and realised, you know what, all of a sudden I'm locked at home, I'm stuck here with my wife and my daughter and my son at the time. I say stuck in a good way. But a lot of other things were removed and a lot of people said this to me. A lot of people realised, hang on a second, I realised maybe people were chasing the dollar and realised that's not what my life's about. All of a sudden the park, I don't know if any of you drove past the park here, 
Man, it was full of families throwing balls with kids and playing games and stuff, you know? It was fantastic. And you could see the people had reprioritised their life. Then, of course, when the restrictions lifted, no one's down there kicking their balls around anymore. People reprioritised. They, they got rid of some, some dead wood out of their life and, 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 and got back to what was really important. But here's the thing. I think and I wonder whether some people reprioritised and unprioritised anything to do with their faith and their church. I've got no time to serve in the church now because, well, that's great that we've all reprioritised, but hey, if I'm one body, if I believe everything these documents say, if Jesus really is who I believe he is and if the church really is who the church is and if we really do have this uh, 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 call of God to influence the world around us and society then maybe chopping off all the things that I ever did to serve in a local... And I'm not just talking about here. You, may, you might be from another church. But if, if you chop off everything to do with serving in your local church, I just wonder whether we have reprioritised some things out that shouldn't have gone out. Because the body of Christ is very important. And the local church is very important. And statistics in Australian society outside the church, uh, the last McCrindle research statistics said that over half of the population believe, un- non-Christian people believe, it's really, really good to have a local church in the community. Even though they don't want to go to it, they believe it's good to have a church there. Even though we don't believe in Jesus, we want to send our kids to Christian schools and religious schools. There's something great about what we carry. And wouldn't it be a shame if if we reprioritised our world and we forgot about the importance of building this community to the point where communities like this disappeared? I don't necessarily think that would be a good thing. And I think it would be a terrible witness for the world So your faith is that important and this church is that important that you have no time for it. You know, it's funny and I don't mean to to criticise anybody here, but if you... Anyone ever heard that term rolling in their grave? You know, they say people roll in their grave. Yeah? Oh, if old Ted heard that, he'd roll in his grave. You know? Jackie sees all the fancy beers that are out there now when I was working at Dan Murphy's. He says, there's about a daddy. If old Ronnie could see those fancy beers, he'd roll in his grave. He just drank 4X. That was it. 4X and water. They both taste the same, apparently. I reckon the early church would be rolling in their grave if they looked at how we treat this community of believers today and how flippant we are with, oh, well, can't be bothered going today. I've got something else on or... And I don't mean that to be a negative. I just think, I go back and I look, because we all talk about it, we all want that. We want to see that, but do we want to be that? Do we want to be that? As a matter of fact, it's not just the early church. You go to most places around the world right now, Asia and Middle East and places like that, mate, they, they just can't wait to get together and to worship together and to be with, with their brothers and their sisters in faith. They can't wait. We're very flippant about gathering together. We're very flippant about serving within our local communities. We're very flippant about our church. It's like, it'll just always be there, and if I need it, I'll pop in and come out. And yet, I can't escape the thought that, that God called us a part of a body, not a prosthetic limb. <laughs> not a prosthetic limb is? It's, re- it's a part that's created to replace a missing part of the body. It's not a part of the body. It's just there, you put it on. You can just detach it and take it off whenever you feel like it and put it back on and take it off and just put it back on when you need it and so on. And I think the church is in danger of having so many... Much, the church is in danger of having a lot of prosthetic limbs who don't realise that a prosthetic limb is not actually part of the body because you're not drawing the same life source and function and you're not interconnected the way that we are meant to be. It's just a thought. Just a thought. I'll finish with this. Acts chapter 2. This is a great picture of the first sermon ever preached in the New Testament age. Peter gets up and he preaches this amazing uh, passage uh, that gives the, the, the crowd a history of Israel and fits Jesus in there, the whole picture of Christ. And about 5,000 people come to faith that day. And here's what it says they did. It says they devoted themselves, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. I love that. They devoted themselves. No one manipulated them, twisted their arm. These guys went, we're in. If we're in, we're in. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Here's a community that have devoted themselves to getting to know their God and being together and miracles are happening around them. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They shared a commonality about life, about purpose. 
They sold their properties and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Forget the selling of everything. The point is they're aware that people had needs around them and they were prepared to help and meet the needs within the family of God. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. Every day, we, we struggle to get people to come here for one hour, one day a week. These guys did it every day in homes in the temple. See what I'm saying? Look, there's, there's a disparity there. We want to see what they saw, but we've got to be who they were to see what they saw. And I believe if we be who they were, we'll see what they saw. Because God hasn't changed. God has not shifted. They sell property possessions, they gathered in the temple courts, broke bread in their homes, ate together, with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. Wow, there's a community that are living what they preach and the community are going, even if we don't believe in it, wow, there's something about you dudes. Something about you guys, something about you ladies. I don't agree with you. I'm not coming. But I can see that you really believe this to the point where it's not just a part of your life. This is your whole life. Wow. And they were in awe of that community of believers. And here's the kicker for me. It says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It's a community full of participation with no spectators. And what's most interesting is of all the things that the community did, and this will be a little in-house church word for those of you that are visiting, you might not understand this word, but the church people will, there's not one mention of evangelism. Not one mention of evangelism. It was all body, community, participation. And when God looked down and saw a community that participated together, a body that understood their commitment to one another and to him, and when they did the stuff together, here's what God said. That is the group that I'm going to come and save people and I'm going to put them in there. They're, that's where I want them to be. And it says that God added to their number daily. What a great evangelism strategy. People are freaked out about walking in the streets and saying to someone, can I talk to you about Jesus? Well then let's start loving each other like a body. Let's start participating like a body. Let's start doing some of that stuff and maybe you won't have to. Maybe God will start adding. I'm not promising that, I'm just saying. What a fantastic picture. Are you a part of the body or are you going to be happy to just be a prosthetic limb? It's your call. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. God, thank you again. I just feel like we're eating a lot of Brussels sprouts these last few weeks, God. And... Uh, yeah, I don't like Brussels sprouts. I hate them. But I know they're good for me. And Lord, I just pray for uh, your word today, God. I pray that God it would do whatever it is that you want to do. Father, would you just speak to people's hearts this morning? Anything that's not for them, let it just roll off, water off a duck's back. But God, whatever it is you're saying, Holy Spirit, to each person here, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would highlight that to them and cause them to think about it, wrestle with it. Lord, let that seed grow into something really, really wonderful. And Lord, I just pray too, Father, for uh, God, each of these uh, kids that we bought these gifts for, God, and everyone that works at Casper, Lord, would you bless them, God? Would you look after them? Would you love on them, God? Uh, Lord, reveal yourself to them, God. They, everybody needs to experience you, God. People want to experience you. They don't want to be told about you. They want to experience you for themselves. Lord, would you let them experience the reality of Jesus, his death, burial, and his resurrection. And Lord, uh, God, in the next seven days as we go from this place, Show us, God, how can we be the church in the world around us? How can we be the church to each other? How can we, uh, uh, Lord, not just talk about stuff to do with Jesus? How can we put legs and hands to it, God? And give us a chance. Give us a chance to be the church that you want us to be, Father. And Lord, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.